imagine that you and your family and friends have been standing on either side of a railroad track for generations, watching as serial trains proceed down the track. Imagine that on one side of the train, there is a letter, an alphabet on each car. On one side of the train, the alphabets spell education. On the other side of the train, the alphabets spell literacy. Imagine further that you are forbidden by law to board the train, and therefore, concomitantly, you are forbidden by law to dream about, to think about, or to reach the destination of the train. Imagine that your own innate sense of education and literacy has been either obliterated or contaminated substantially by your circumstances for generations. Then imagine that there comes a time when you are finally permitted to board that train, of course, in the rear cars, and that you leave the environment on the side of that train behind and that no one on the train, particularly the conductor, the railroad company, or any of the other leaders of the train, understand the environment that you left behind on the side of the train. They understand only the environment of the train's origins. And therefore, the perspectives and all of the lessons taught on that train and at that destination are consistent with the railroad company, not yours. My name is Vanzetta Penn McPherson, and like Sophia Bracey Harris earlier this week, I am what EJI is calling a local. As a native of and resident of Montgomery, I am, like all of the rest of us, flooded with memories of the Civil Rights Movement and immersed in all of the details of the accountings and stories that you have heard and will continue to hear on this marvelous celebration. But in spite of that flooding and that immersion, I am also very gratified, and I have a renewed sense of enlightenment by E.J. Eyes and Brian Stevenson's brilliant creation of the Legacy Museum and the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. Because of several things, not just the art, the sculpture, the sobriety, not just the necessity for those sites, but also because EJI has spectacularly created and articulated the nexus between slavery and mass incarceration. They have answered the question that so many have posed, and that question is why? They have answered another question that is always necessary in any analytical analysis of a phenomenon, and that question is how. This morning, there are three scholars who will enlighten all of us with their research and with their brilliance as well. Dr. Walter Gilliam is a professor in the Child Studies Center at Yale University. His research involves early childhood education and intervention policy. And his research seeks to find ways and implement ways to improve the quality of pre-kindergarten and child care services and the impact of early childhood education programs 
on children's school readiness. Dr. Howard Stevenson is a chair professor of Africana Studies in the Human Development and Quantitative Methods Division at the University of Pennsylvania. And in case you're wondering, yes, there is gravitas to his surname. He is, among other things, proof that the Stevenson gene pool contains chromosomes for both excellence and racial integrity. Dr. Stevenson's research focuses on negotiating racial conflicts and using racial literacy for independent and public K through 12 schooling, community mental health centers, teachers, police, and parents. And he will tell you about the ways in which he implements his research and after you hear him, you will understand, after you hear all of them, you will understand why they are the recipients of impressive and substantial grants. Dr. Margaret Beale Spencer has done and continues to do impressive and esoteric research. Her theories provide an identity-focused cultural ecological perspective, and it serves as the foundation for her gender, culture, and context acknowledging for developmental race and ethnicity-sensitive research emphasis. All of these scholars will bring you important perspectives. They will bring you valuable information. For those of you who have already toured the Legacy Museum, you know that one of EJI's objectives is to establish the connectivity between slavery and mass incarceration, with lynching, among other things, uh, being the middle component. So I hope that I am accurately analogizing that nexus in what I am about to say. Think of Dr. Gilliam's research as slavery. Think of Dr. Stevenson's research as lynching. And analytically, think of Dr. Spencer's research as mass incarceration. The how and the why. Certainly, criminal justice reform is a commanding imperative in our lives. But so too is education. No one can deny the nexus among the three. So I invite your attention to a most enlightening panel. Thank you for being with us this week and today. Good morning. And yes, I am Brian Stevenson's brother. <laughs> We're going to talk about that a little later. Um, tonight, today, this morning, we're here to talk about education in America, race, implicit bias, and saving our children. I'm delighted to have my colleagues here today. Uh, the order, um, Walter's going to go first. Um, Margaret's going to go second, I'm going to go third, and then we're going to have a conversation between us about, about our work. Thank you. Go for it, Is Walter. that my cue? That's your cue, brother. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here among all of you, among uh, dear, dear friends and colleagues and, 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 and collaborators in this important work that we're doing regarding our children and how our children experience the world around them. I'm going to start off in, by telling you about a story. This is a story about a, a little girl. Her name is Jaisha. And this was in St. Petersburg, Florida in the years 2005. And uh, she was having a, a rough day that day when she went to school. She, um, she, was, she, was, she was having some things that were concerning her. And, and, and she was wearing one of those expressions on her face. Tell me if you've seen this before. It's, it's somewhere halfway between I'm going to cry 
and, and I'm going to be angry and look angry so I don't cry. You ever seen that expression before out of a, out of a, out of a young child, four or five years old? So she's five years old. She's in kindergarten. And she had that expression on her, on her face. And she was in the principal's office. Police came in. St. Petersburg Police Department, kindergarten, five-year-old little girl, came in to the vice <coughs> principal's office. They'd already evacuated the, the classroom and came in and, and arrested her in kindergarten. And you can see her be put over the table, three police officers, and, um, and they went to put the handcuffs on her. But as the story goes, the handcuffs don't work very well when you're five years old. So they put the handcuffs on her ankles. And they used nylon on her hand and carried her out to the police car. Put her in the police car, then took her from there to the police station, held her in the police station until her mother could come and, and pick her up. And that was because she was having a bad day. Now, I, um, I, I saw this video, and, 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 and people had contacted me for comments on this. And when I saw the video, you know, a lot of things kind of went through my mind. And one of the things that went through my mind was, was well, this is in an elementary school. You know, why, why the St. Pete Police Department on a five-year-old, on a baby? Why, is, why the St. Police, the St. Petersburg Police Department? Why not school psychologist? Why not school nurse? Why not somebody from the social work department? I mean, they had all these people there, you know? Why not contact, why not just go into the hallway and just randomly pick some adult? Just grab any, anybody other than the St. Pete Police Department, you know? And, and, and when, when, you, when you see this, the, uh, the other questions that kind of pop into your mind too, at least for me, was why is it that sometimes when we can see a child with behaviors we don't like, you know, behaviors that, 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 that we as adults might not want them to be having, why is it that with some kids we can look at them and we can say, that child needs support, that child needs help? And with some children, we see the exact same kind of behaviors and we say, that child needs to be contained. That child needs to be excluded. That child needs to be removed, taken away from the rest of us good people. You know, what is that and why is that that sometimes we have these decisions that happen sometimes just like that in the back of our head. Probably nobody sat down and thought about it. It's just something that clicked in the back of their head that made them decide whether this child was this child or this child was that child. You know, and so that's what went through my head when I saw the video that you're not going to be able to watch right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I started looking into this issue in 2002, 2005 of children being expelled from preschool programs. Now bear in mind we're talking about children three and four years old. These children have been talking for about one or two years. These children have been out of diapers for about one or two years. These are babies. These are babies. These are our babies. These are really young children. Three, four years old in preschool programs being kicked out of the program, expelled from the program because somebody didn't feel that they had the resources to bear to be able to meet that child's needs. And, and when you think about it, expulsion is the capital punishment of the schools. It doesn't get any more severe than that. It's kicking kids out completely, giving up on children. And in this case, we're talking about giving up on babies, giving up on children three, four years old. So when we started looking at this, you can see on the slide the expulsion rate for grades K through 12. 2.1 per thousand children. This is full-on expulsion kicked out of the program. For preschool children, we're talking about 6.7 per thousand. In other words, children are expelled from preschool programs at a rate more than three times that of grades K through 12 combined. And then when you look at child care programs, it's more than 13 times the rate of grades K through 12 combined. That's a lot of kids. And we can look at this data in a lot of ways. We can look at it this way too. Here's the pre-K expulsion rate, the rate at which children are being kicked out of preschool programs. This is the rate at which children are kicked out of grades K through 12. And just for comparison, here's the rate of incarceration in the United States. And when you look at the amount of racial disparity and gender disparity between preschool expulsion and adult incarceration, almost identical. So if there is a pipeline from preschool to prison, it's amazing how consistent the diameter of that pipe is all the way through the entire process. We cannot start worrying about our children and our families when they're adolescents. 
when they're 20s. We gotta be worrying about them in preschool. We gotta be worrying about and thinking about how we're treating them all the way down to when they're babies. So when I started looking, thank you. When I started looking at things that predict this, what, what accounts for you know, whether a program is more likely to be kicking a child out of, a, out of the program, we see things like you know, the number of children per adult. It, relates to, to how likely a child is to be expelled. More children per adult, the more likely a child is to be expelled. Um, how long the program is in terms of its length of day, whether it's a half day program, school day length, extended hours. Teacher job stress, and teachers who screen positive for depression expel at twice the rate. The amount of services that are available to the teacher. All these things are the best predictors that we have for whether a child is expelled from a preschool program. But what do all these predictors, these best predictors, of whether a child is expelled from a preschool program, what do they all have in common? None of them have anything to do with the child. They're not child variables. These are adult variables. These are program variables. These are our variables about the things that we provide and the things we do not provide to our babies. And that's what best predicts how our babies end up getting treated. And so when you think about it, preschool expulsion is not a child behavior. It is an adult decision. It is a decision that we make regarding whether or not we have and want to bring to bear the services and the supports for our children or if it's easier and more convenient for us to just give up on them. So who is it that gets expelled from preschool programs? So we started collecting more of this information and we found this. In mixed age classrooms where you have threes and four year old preschoolers together, four year old child's about 50% more likely than the three year old child to be expelled. Now we didn't know exactly what to make out of that, you know, so we asked a group of preschool teachers, pulled in a focus group and said, in a national study, teachers said, said that four-year-olds are more likely to be expelled than the three-year-olds in these mixed-age groups. Why do you think that is? And they thought about it and they said, well, you know, it's one thing if a child's got behavior problems or is aggressive and the child's this big, but it's different if the child's this big. <laughs> and then we said, well, why? why? Why when you're deciding whether to expel a child, why does height matter? And how do you, how do you factor that into the equation? And they said, well, you know, it's, it's like this. If the child is small, then the child might be smaller than the other children. But if the child's a little bigger, then the child might be bigger than some of the other children, and maybe someone will get hurt. And that was a clue to us, that if we're taking these teachers at their work, what they're telling us, us is this. It's not the behavior of the child. It's what I imagine about that behavior. It's what I think about that behavior. It's all kinds of other things that pop into our head, and that's when it really dawned on us that this is not really about children's behaviors. This is about the things that go into adults' minds when they look at kids, when they look at our children. Black preschoolers expelled twice the rate of white preschoolers. Boys, more than four times the rate of girls. And so when you think about it, there's really three Bs of expulsion risk in preschool. You have big, black, and boy. And the more of those that exist within a single child, the greater the likelihood that that child is to be expelled, to be kicked out, to be excluded, to be told not to come back. And I've heard preschool expulsion be described in a lot of different ways. I was giving a talk to a group of preschool teachers, and one of them said, well, I don't really like it when you call it expulsion. And, and I thought to myself, well, well, I don't, I don't really like it when you do it. <laughs> but, but, but now, not everything you think you should say and not everything you think you should tweet. So I, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. So instead, I said, well, what do you like to call it? And, and she said, well, we call it not yet ready for school readiness. And then somebody else said, this was my favorite. Somebody else said, well, we call it giving the child the gift of time. <laughs> and I, that sounds pretty good. I'd like, I'd like to be expelled, but you're going to call it that. I could use a little more time in my life. You know, so anyway, you know, no matter what you call it, it's still kicking babies out. It's still kicking babies out of preschool. So we started doing this work, and, and uh, I got contacted by a member of the Congressional Black Caucus, a member of the House Education Committee named Danny Davis. Mr. Davis contacted us because he was concerned about this issue and the disproportionality of race in terms of gender and everything and challenges to look at race and gender combined. He had a deputy chief of staff at that time, still does, named Jill Hunter Williams, who, who used to be an early childhood mental health consultant for Head Start, working on his staff. You know, the only person I know on Capitol Hill in a senior level position that used to be an early childhood mental health consultant. 
You know, and so here we had a member of Congress who cared about this problem with a deputy chief of staff who understood the solution. And in my line of work, where we're trying to work at the intersect of child development research and social policy, we have a word for that rare moment when you get a member of Congress who cares about the problem, who has a deputy chief of staff who understands the solution. And the name of that rare moment that we use, this technical term is, it is called a hot damn moment. <laughs> and you don't get a lot of those, you know, but when you do get one, you gotta grab it, you know. And so, started working with, uh, with uh, the, the good congressman, and he put pressure on the United States Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights to start collecting data on preschool age children. Now, sometimes when you hear me say Office for Civil Rights, I will say it really slow, like Office for Civil Rights. When you hear me say it slow like that, please hear it as if I'm uttering the name of an endangered species. So when you see it threatened, you'll have known its name. Because for those who might not want to care about all of our babies, the very best way to avoid caring for all of our babies is to deny yourself of the data that shows the inequities. Office for Civil Rights. So you can see some of the data there that they had collected on this and what the rates are. Lots of different ways in which, which you can think about uh, bias and how bias plays out. Things like uh, research that was done by Russell Skiba, elementary school age ch children and middle school children. Uh, and in the study that he did, he had data regarding the age and grade level and gender and and, and, and race and ethnicity, and he knew the behavioral infraction. What did the child do wrong? And then he knew what happened to the child as a result of that. What he did was he had this data, masked up all the other data, except for just the behavioral infraction, just the description of what the child did. Gave it to a bunch of teachers, had them rate the severity of this. How bad is this really, if this were to happen in your classroom? Then unmasked the data, analyzed the data, and found out that even when you look at the same level of severity of the behavior problem, when you compare children, the black child is more likely to be sent to the principal's office than the white child, more likely to be suspended, more likely to be expelled, even when the behaviors are the same. And when they started controlling for socioeconomic status, even though socioeconomic status matters in the equation, race still mattered on top of it all. It's not just about socioeconomic status. It's about race, too. You cannot take race out of the equation. Philip Goff and some folks have done some other studies where they were looking at descriptions of children's behaviors, and, and they provided this description maybe of a child's behavior, a child who may or may not have done the bad deed, may or may not have broken the vase, may or may not have lost the ball. Had people, adults, rate how guilty do you think the child is? Do you think the child really did it? Do you think the child didn't do it? And they showed them different pictures of children, some black, some white, some boys, some girls. And whenever they showed them the picture of a black boy, the guilty rating went up. It's the same story. It's the same story. But if there's a black male face that's put with it, it just seems a little guiltier. And so that's what they had found. Oh, and all the children in the, in, the, in the study were between the ages of 10 and 17 in the pictures. At the end, they asked people to guess how old these children were. They overestimated the age of the black children on average by about four and a half years. And these children were between the ages of 10 and 17. That's a lot of overestimating when you're talking about children. Um, feeling less pain. Lots of studies showing that even young children, this is a study by Dora, pulled in five-year-old children, um, uh, seven-year-old children, 10-year-old children. Had them rate pain, rate how much something might hurt. Pretend you stubbed your toe, how much would it hurt? You bit your tongue, hit your head. And at five years old, they didn't find any differences. But by the time the children were seven years old, whenever they asked them to rate how much something would hurt and showed them a picture of a black boy and asked how much it would hurt that black boy, the children thought that it would hurt that black boy less than it would hurt them if they weren't black and less than it would hurt another child. And by the time the children were 10 years old, it was a robust finding. Now, there's not a lot of things that we know enough about when it comes to our preschool teachers and child care providers. We need to learn a whole lot more. But one thing that I know for a fact is this. Every one of our preschool and child care providers in America, they are all older than seven. Every single one of them. And if we're carrying this in us by the time we're seven years old, then can you just imagine how much more that will be left in there? This is a video clip that we showed some teachers. And when we showed the teachers this video clip, we asked them to look at the video clip 
and identify challenging behaviors. See how many behavior problems you can find, and can you find evidence that a behavior problem is going to happen really soon? Um, and we had an eye tracker attached to them. And the eye tracker, uh, you can see here in this video, you can see there's somebody, a teacher getting ready to do the eye tracking exam. You'll see a little black bar at the bottom of the screen. That's an eye tracker. It tells us down to the pixel on the screen in the thousandth of a second exactly where the teacher's looking. There's a research assistant. You can see she's looking at the exact same thing. That yellow dot is where that teacher's looking at that specific moment. Now, what we did was we told the teachers, look for challenging behaviors. But what we didn't tell them is the truth. And the truth is this, there's no behavior problems in any of these videos because they're all child actors that I hired to sit at a table and play with Play-Doh. <laughs> one of them was a black boy, one was a black girl, one was a white boy, white girl. And what I'm really interested in, in is not how fast can you find behavior problems, because there aren't any to find. What I'm interested in is when I lead you to believe somebody's gonna misbehave, who do you look at? Who do you look at first? Who do you look at longest? Who do you keep going back to? In other words, if you were a mall cop, who would you be following at the gap right now? That's basically what we were doing. And what we found, <laughs> what we found was this. At the end of the study, we showed them the pictures of the four children. And we said, which child do you think you had to watch the most? And then the screen went blank and we asked them, put in the letter of the child that you feel you had to watch the most. Now, we didn't need to ask them who they watched the most. I know down to the thousands of a second who you watched. What we're curious about it is this, when I lead you to believe that somebody's gonna misbehave, where do your biases take your eyes? And then at this point, are you aware of where your biases took your eyes? And then later after that, are you willing to admit it? And what we basically found was that teachers spend more time looking at the black child when we lead them to believe that someone's gonna misbehave, and that's true for white teachers and it's true for black teachers too. But, they think they have a boy bias. They think they spend more time looking at boys, especially the black boy, but the reality is they spend more time looking at black children, especially the black boy. You know, so there's the bias is there, but for teachers, they might be perceiving it as a somewhat different bias, a somewhat more socially acceptable boys will be boys kind of bias. <clears throat> you can see what it looks like here in terms, each one of those dots is where a teacher's looking. There's a new study out of the Yale Child Study Center, but I had to read a few times just to believe what it was telling me. The researchers recruited about 135 preschool teachers. They had them watch video footage of four kids playing, a black boy, a black girl, a white boy, and a white girl. And they told the teachers, their subjects, watch the video, there may be some challenging behaviors. As soon as you see something that could become challenging, hit the enter key on your keypad. Well, here's the trick. There was no challenging behavior. The researchers were using eye scan technology to see which child the teachers were looking at the most. And what they found is that the teachers, both white and black alike, spent the most time watching the black boy, waiting for bad behavior that never came. There's one more really interesting headline in this study, which comes later. The teachers were also given a one paragraph description to read of a hypothetical child with a stereotypical name who behaves pretty badly in class pushes, scratches, throws toys. And some of the teachers were also given some biographical information that helped make sense of that behavior. They were told that the child lives with his mother, a father has been in and out for years, they're relatively poor, the mother is depressed, works three jobs. Researchers wanted to know if knowing this information made the teachers more empathetic to the kid. Well, here's the shock. It, it did, but only if the teacher and the child were of the same race. If the teacher and the child, a white teacher and a black child, or even a black teacher and a white child, knowing that biographical information, those teachers were less empathetic towards those students. And here's why this matters. Imagine, if this is true, if there's this empathy deficit in preschool, well, imagine where else that's true. We work with NPR a lot when we try to push out the messages from some of the studies that we do because we think that it's important for people other than researchers to be able to actually read some of these findings. Um, one other study that I'll tell you about really quickly before I wrap up is another study by, by some, some, some colleagues at uh, University of Washington. What they were studying was this. When you give preschoolers a video of two adults interacting 
And in one set of videos, the person's leaning in and smiling. And in another set of videos, the person's leaning back and not smiling at the person. And you change the shirt that's on the other person. And then you ask these preschoolers, three or four year old children, which person do you think was the nice one? If they saw the video where the person wearing the blue shirt was being interacted with in a friendly way, they assumed that that person was a nice person. And if they saw a video where the person was leaning back and the person had a green shirt on, and they thought, they thought, well, that person's not a nice person. And that makes a lot of sense. But where it gets really interesting is this. They then showed them pictures of people that weren't in the study who just happened to be wearing blue shirts or green shirts. And if they'd been exposed to a video where somebody was interacting positively with a person with a green shirt on, the next time they saw a person with a green shirt, even though they'd never seen that person before, they thought that person is a nice person too. And if they saw negative interactions, they thought that person's not a nice person also. In other words, what they did with preschoolers is they, in just a couple of minutes, created a shirt bias. And if we can do that with preschoolers in just a couple of minutes, imagine what we can do with skin tone and how quickly we can do it. The findings that we had concern me. These findings right here scare the hell out of me because it basically tells us that if we don't get on top of this, we're really going to be hurting our kids. I gave a talk like this once in, in, in Las Vegas, and when I was talking there, I, um, I, I, I sat down after the talk and everything, and then the MC, you can see the MC on the right there, brought a little girl up on the stage. I didn't know there was any children in the audience, and brought this little girl up and asked her what she thought about what was happening at the conference and what she'd seen. I didn't know there was any kids there, and I, I'm keenly aware of the fact that when I'm talking about these things, I'm really not talking about my daughter. I'm talking about other people's children and how people view other people's children. But I didn't really know that I was going to be talking to one of those children there. And so she was up on the stage, and, she, and the person asked, you know, what did you, what did you make of this? You know, and I'm sitting on, like, every word, because I'm, I'm honestly just very, very concerned about what she's going to say, and, it, and, it, and it, really, it really worried me. And so she asked her that, and then the little girl said, well, I, I remember the, the, the professor guy talking about how teachers view children. And then she said, and boy, at that point, I'm really listening, like every word she's saying. And then the MC asked her, well, what did you, uh, what did you make of that? And she said, well, um, me and my friends, we, we already knew it. We just didn't think you all did. <laughs> and that's when I decided I'm not going to quit talking about this. I was worried. I was worried that we were talking about something that was going to upset her. She already knew it. She knew it way before I knew it. She knew it way before I ever discovered it. So why should we care about children being expelled from preschool programs? When you think about it, social justice and civil rights are often matters of access. It's about getting in something. It's also about making sure you're not kicked out of something. It's about making sure you have a seat on a bus, or it can be about a seat at a deli counter. It can be about a seat at the place at the voting polls. It can be about a seat in higher education or in elementary school. But it's not just about getting in the front door, it's about making sure you're not pushed out the back door, too. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Margaret? Good morning. Because, because we're really out, um, so down uh, in terms of our time, I'm going to forego my slides because I think it's very important, uh, given um, uh, Dr. Gilliam's wonderful presentation, that I leave you with an, uh, an important message in terms of adolescence. On the one hand, as Dr. Gilliam's remarks shared, young children are at a particular developmental period in terms of size, in terms of how they think, etc. So in many ways, the issues of their treatment and their experiences really have to do with the context, the nature of the socialization agents that support their development. You know, what happens at home, how we speak to our children in terms of preparing them for this world. And so in many ways, in terms of although kids are exposed to these messages, what's really important in terms of what happens in those first seven years is that youngsters don't internalize what it means for the self because they are cognitively self-centered. Not the kind of narcissism that we see <clears throat> in Washington. <laughs> but I'm talking about a normal human development quality of thought that's appropriate for kids through age seven. 
But when I began talking about adolescence, that's a very different developmental period. I happen to love adolescence. Why I love adolescence? Because I consider that developmental period is representing the last bastion of truth. And then we learn to lie. Mm -hmm. And we lie most often about uh, the experience of injustice. Well, in the first seven years of life, ways of thinking represent a certain level of maturation. But just think about this, 10 years later, when they're no longer seven and they're 17, and they have the height, they have the build, and they have the ways of thinking and the capacity to reflect on that thinking in terms of the self, then it's a very different situation. And without our acknowledging that in terms of how we teach kids, what we model for our adolescents, it means then that very often they take it upon themselves to make sense of the world, to make sense of a world of injustice. When being an American, a hyphenated American, means something, one thing, if you don't have melanin. And it means something else if you have melanin, if you have skin color. And what's important about adolescents is that they have the cognitive capacity and abstract way of thinking to understand that and they resist and they, and they push back. But they're telling the truth. The difficulty in a society where injustice has become the norm is that we cannot handle their truth. And that is why the school is pipe, that's the prison pipeline. And so we all can talk some more, I know, during discussion, but because we're running out of time, I want to leave you with the notion that part of our task as socializing agents and supporting, educating, and maximizing education of our adolescents in particular is that we have to model truth. The EGI is really important because it gives us more supports in doing our jobs well. And being able to articulate the history of injustice in this country to help adolescents to understand that they don't have to cope and figure out things on their own, that they have supports and we're the sources of support. So we want to maximize youngsters' intellectual functioning. I mean, the gap findings may suggest that these youngsters are not doing as well as ideal, but when you think about it, we're talking about adolescents who live under conditions of high risk and very often in terms of schools and communities in terms of policing, for example, they don't have supports to offset the risk and the challenges that they're experiencing, but many still show resiliency. So our job is to understand the sources of support that result in resiliency, that, resort, that uh, result in children's, children, adolescents doing well, irrespective of the risk that they are burdened by, and then ratchet up the supports. Be, and make sure that the supports, in fact, are experienced by adolescents as, in, as in, indeed supportive. All the pro-offered supports are not experienced as supportive, and therefore it's a waste of resources, it's a waste of human capital. Yeah. And because we're short on time, because um, I want to have our discussion time as well, and plus Howard's presentation, I want to leave you with this in terms of my formal remarks. I know that adolescents can be very difficult because, like I said, they call us out. They're no longer seven. They now have the intellectual capacity to critique the environment, to critique us, and, of course, we're paying for their, uh, their upkeep. However, why the investment is important because we have to do this, not just because it's the right thing to do, it's because these are young people who will make decisions about the character of our own old age. So if you can't do it because it's right, then do it because you're fearful. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Walter, thank you, Margaret. And we will have some time to discuss. Let me see if my slides are... Okay. All right, so... <clears throat> I didn't expect to start with this slide, but um, 
you don't know how crazy it is when people come up to you and say, do you know this dude named Brian <laughs> Stevenson? <laughs> Have you ever heard him speak? And uh, so I thought, I, since I'm around a bunch of lawyers, I should probably give some proof. So, um, uh, yes, I, my brother and I stayed in the same bed for 12 years. We lived in the same bed. And he was uh, a roommate of mine in college. And so, yeah, I think I do kind of know him a little bit. Um, and part of the uh, reason that we're talking here today and the re area of research that I've been interested in for a long time as a father, as a son, as a researcher, as a therapist has been, does it matter when parents talk to their kids about race? We call that racial socialization. And the answer to that question is yes, right? And to what degree, it begs other questions, to what degree um, does, it, does it push us to understand from the child's perspective, what is racial justice and racial injustice like? A lot of times we think about it from the perspective of adults. And as parents, what does it feel like when you have to prepare your children for a world that doesn't appreciate who they are, who doesn't see their humanity, whether it's preschool or adolescence? And so the idea of that talk that many of us know that we try to give, we fumble through, and in some of our research is teaching families how do you have that talk, it's very stressful. And so um, to the degree that we think of, how do we see these issues of injustice in the eyes of children? So this is my brother and I when we were very young. Um, we were uh, in many respects um, trying to escape Southern Delaware. We were running away, we kind of agreed. Uh, he was my road dog as it were. And so on our way, we realized we can't drive and, uh, <laughs> and we got caught by our parents. And as you can see here, Brian even then could not tell a lie. Um, uh, my father had fantasies of us being twins, so that's why we always looked alike until we were <laughs> 17. And um, so, just to let you know, he's my brother. This is our family growing up. And people also ask me, you know, about my brother and I, but um, I have to remind them, we also had a sister who is the little girl you see here, and she looks exactly the same today as she did then. <laughs> Um, just to let people know. And my parents were very different. Um, and even here you can see um, Brian's skepticism about injustice. <laughs> um, you know, he's looking, what is that photo what photographer trying to do here? You know, I was like, you know, there's an injustice going on. So started early. Um, but having a, a family uh, like ours is a little different. My parents were very different in how they dealt with racial conflict. My father, who just passed away a few year, uh, uh, a year ago, uh, was here with the hat. He, he worked in the movie theater uh, in Rehoboth Beach, and uh, his belief was when there was racial conflict uh, that we had to face, is because he had us in church, which seemed like 24 hours a day, seven days a week, he believed that if somebody bothers you, you pray for them, and God will get them back in the end. <laughs> You're never sure when the end was going to be, but that was his belief. It was spiritual. It was one day in that great getting up morning. That was his idea. Um, very Martin Luther Kingish, right? Um, in some respects, he differed from my mother. Very different. She was more Malcolm X-like. <laughs> um, if my father and my mother could look down now as they are, they would be singing and shouting at what my brother has done. It's, it's amazing. Um, so, yeah. So my mother, um, my mother had a very different style. So she was not waiting for any resolution in the end. She was literally right now in your face. Growing up in North Philly, very different sort of approach. <laughs> You know, when we were children, you can imagine some parents, some mothers, after you wake up in the morning saying to their kids while they're in the bathroom, you know, pick up your clothes because this bedroom looks like a, like a pigsty. My mother's a little different. We'd be in the bathroom, she'd be saying stuff. We, did, we didn't land on Plymouth Rock. Plymouth Rock <laughs> landed on us. <laughs> and so we would say, yes, mom, yes, mom going about our day. 
And so, in the interest of, of both time so I could get to my colleagues, I'm reminded of Martin Luther King, who in his letter to, from a Birmingham jail made a comment. He's, he's talking to folks about dealing with racism and unjust laws and debating the whole idea of why it's important to resist. And there's a point at which he stops become a preacher, becoming a preacher, he stops being an activist, and he becomes a parent. He says, you suddenly find your tongue twisted, he stressed, tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television and see tears welling up in her eyes when she is told that Fun Town is closed to colored children and see ominous clouds, beautiful imagery, ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky. And I think of that when we think about education. To what degree are we ready to address the ominous clouds of inferiority that are beginning to form in our children's little mental sky? So the work that we're doing, we know that racism, and I make the argument that interpersonal contact around race is just as important as systemic issues. If you look at the police encounters that have led to the deaths of young people and adults of color, they've happened within less than two minutes. And a lot of our ideas about racial progress and justice are ideological. The question is, can they be decisions that we make in less than two minutes? Is there a way to translate those ideas to actions when we're under the most incredibly intense stressful moments to make a healthy decision. So we know that racial stress related to racism is connected to a variety of health outcomes for men and women. And it so happens that racial socialization, talking to children about race can be an antidote, somewhat of an antidote. And the question we had is why is it in our studies we've been finding this positive outcomes related to racial socialization? And we've been looking at this notion over time as to why. And one, one, one idea is that um, the more parents talk to their children around race, the more they're prepared for what's about to happen, right? That's, that's why this museum is so important. Because mm -hmm. <clears throat> if you don't know what is about to happen, right. based on what has been happening for a very long time, how can you be prepared for it? And so we've been teaching um, folks around the country about literacy, this ability to read, to recast, and to resolve a racially stressful encounter when you only have two minutes. Reading is, can I see when a racial moment shows up? Mm. Recasting is, if I'm a level of 10 stress level on a scale of one to 10, how do I bring that 10 down to a five so that I can get my brain back on, 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 on point where I can see, I can hear, I can make a decision, an adjust decision that matches my racial ideology in less than two minutes? And resolve is, do I make a healthy decision that isn't an underreaction where I pretend that really didn't bother me, that racial moment, or an overreaction in which I exaggerate that moment and leave unhealthily. So we teach people to do this sort of strategy over time, which involves a lot of practice, calculate, locate, communicate, breathe and exhale. Calculate is what feeling am I having in the middle of this racial moment on a scale of one to 10? It could be positive, it could be negative, Locate is where in my body do I feel it? And the more specific you can be, like a Native American fifth grader told me at a Chicago school that she was angry at a nine, that she was the only Native American girl in the school. And she said, I can feel it in my body, in my stomach. It's like a bunch of butterflies fighting so much with each other. They fly up into my choke and to, to my throat and choke me. If a fifth grader can be that detailed, why can't we? And communicate is what messages come to my mind, what statements, what images that, that remind me of who I am in this moment. And so we've been training this for quite a while. The problem with this work around racial socialization, we believe it prepares young people and can lead to racial literacy, but the problem is it takes practice. And I know some of you are saying practice, <laughs> practice. We're talking about practice. <laughs> yes, we are talking about practice. It so happened that in August of 2013, I have two babies um, who are sitting in the front row. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> Brian kept saying that uh, he's trying not to get weepy, but unfortunately, we're full of weepiness this entire week. Hmm. Um, 
But I have two babies, and I worry about them as if um, something might happen to them, as many of us do for our children. My oldest, Brian, is 27. My youngest, Julian, is 13. And we don't have time to talk about how that happened at all. Whatever. <laughs> so Julian and I, one day, August of 2013, were watching television, or we really were just, we were just um, folding clothes, which in and of itself is such a rare occurrence. We should have known something strange was going to happen. <laughs> and in the process, on CNN, Trayvon Martin's parents were, were on the television crying. Hmm. And Juliet, at eight years old, became glued to the television. He had a thousand questions. Julian always has a thousand questions. He wanted to know, why did this happen to Trayvon? He wanted to know, and I was not ready for that discussion. It was stressful. Even after 20 years, 25 years of talking to people how to talk to children, I was stressed. I wasn't ready to have the discussion. And so um, I'm going to play for you a little bit of that conversation now. It's like we're, 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 we're better than you, and yes. there's nothing you can do about that. And if you scare me or something like that, I will shoot you because I'm scared of you. Exactly. And the, right, the problem is, is that because of bad images on television, the way that people are trained and raised when they grow up, they're, they're raised to be scared of black boys and black people. And it's not right, it's not fair, but, you know, and it's one thing to be scared. People get scared all the time, but it's wrong to take that fear and say it's okay to kill somebody or hurt somebody. And I don't, I don't like the idea, and that's why Daddy gets mad about it sometimes, but that's also why Mommy and Daddy want to teach you so that if anybody is following you, that you need to know how to talk to them and to stand up for yourself, yet not, not underreact or overreact. You know what underreact means? Like, it means like you pretend um, nothing's yeah, happening. Yeah. What does that mean? Like, you know something's happening. I'm pretending, oh, it's fine. Yeah. But overreacting is like yelling and saying, oh, my God, I, 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 it's just like you're panicking. Yes, exactly. And, that, and, and, and partly that's because even with cops, some cops who are not, um, and all cops are not bad, most cops know exactly what they're doing, but some cops might be, um, have been caught being afraid of African-American boys and then try to be difficult or, or rough with them and treat them as if they're doing something wrong. I, you know, you want to treat everybody right. You always do. I noticed that. Um, but it, if somebody It's not the same you, for everyone else. It's, it's not, not always the same. No, you yeah, got to be careful. Yeah, because people can disrespect you. Exactly. And, I'm going to uh, think that you're... You don't... You don't look... You don't look like you're... It's like... They're saying that you don't look right, uh, so I guess I have the right to disrespect you. Yeah, and that's what we call, and this, we call that racism, that some people, a lot of people, unfortunately, will look at a boy who, like Trayvon or like you uh, with a hoodie on and see that maybe you're, and believe there's something you're going to do wrong instead of other people who wear hoodies, they don't look at, at them the same way, and uh, that's wrong. And that's why Daddy wants you to be safe, and that's why... So you mean, like, when, when you said other people, you mean, like, if, if Trayvon was a white, um, then he wouldn't be disrespected like that? We don't believe he would be dis disrespected like that. No, not, not in that neighborhood where Trayvon went. Um, but the other thing is true, that even black people can look at other black people as if there's something wrong with them and other <laughs> boys, and that's just as, that's a problem, too. We're just as concerned as if anybody says, I'm better than you. Really? Anybody who looks at another kid and says, I'm better than you, or you're, out, you're more dangerous, or you're a criminal because you're black, and you're a child or a boy, that is wrong. It doesn't matter who does it. And, Dad, I need to stop you there. What? So remember when we were at that, invited me over at the swimming pool, um, Mommy told me that there was a guy disrespecting us, and they were like, oh, the two guys, yeah. and they were like, what? Yeah. Well, what are you doing? They are like, 
they were looking at us like, well, what are you doing here? Yeah. And then, and then, they, and then they're like, I thought this place was white people only. Is it's that like what he said? Well, I don't, I don't, well, he looked like that. He's like, no, he had he, a he, look. I don't think he said that, according to mom. Yeah, like, no, it looked, it looked like, he probably looked like he's like, huh? Because what are these guys doing? What are these guys doing here? Yeah, he had that disposition, that yeah. attitude. I just want you to know that that's somebody else's problem. That's not your problem. That's their problem. Don't you ever think that you're less than somebody else. And no matter how people treat you, if they treat you bad, it means they don't know how to treat people right. You understand that? Don't you start thinking there's something wrong with me. Um, I must be bad. No, that ain't, that ain't got nothing to do with somebody else accusing you. They're wrong. They're misguided. They're messed up in the head, not you. And that was the problem with George Zimmerman. His parents didn't teach him how to deal with his emotions. Didn't, didn't well, maybe they him. did, but he did the wrong choice. Well, it's possible they could have talked to him, but I don't think so. The way they talked about their son, they think that... Uh, Wait a minute, uh, George Zimmerman, you mean? Parents, yeah. Yeah. What did they say about him? Well, I think they basically felt that he was justified to to, to follow. And what stop. the? Yeah, I think that's wrong. I think that's that's okay. one of it. So they're saying he has the right to follow a black kid, get in a fight with him, and shoot him. Well, I don't think they're saying that he had a right to. to I think they felt because he was scared of him, they had a right to shoot him. But what? they they do not in any way see what was wrong about what yeah. Trayvon Martin did. I mean, what uh, George, George Zimmerman did. did. That, well, what's wrong? Yeah, that's the... Their parents must be so, so, so sad. You think that, that you can't go places and uh, daddy's gonna be behind you 100%. You got good friends and we're not gonna make sure you're in any place that you're not safe. We're gonna be be with you, but um, just in case. This, this doesn't happen a lot, but just in case. Right? I did the same thing with Brian. I gave him the same talk. We call this the stalking talk. If anybody tries to bother my child, mm -mm -mm. what will happen? Well, they better run. Because what? I'm going to get them. <laughs> I'm gonna get him. Really? Oh yeah. Well then they're gonna get you because they might have weapons. Well, or you know what? I'm gonna call police too, like I should, but I feel like I wanna get them. But you can't you gotta you're right. You can't just you can't you just can, go chasing they can people. Be armed. They can be armed. Yeah, you're right, you're yeah, right. Yeah, they can right. be armed. Yeah, you right. I feel like I wanna Plus, chase them. I know, I feel like I wanna go get them. They can they can mess be. with my son. I don't like that. Mm. But I, I got you're right, you gotta be careful. And um, you gotta, you gotta be careful, cause you never know what some crazy people will think about you. And so, as long as you believe you're beautiful, like Daddy believes you're beautiful, and handsome, and Mommy believes you're beautiful, and handsome, and smart, and you deserve to be on this planet, just as happy and beautiful and smart as you want to be, you could do anything you want, baby. That's what my Mommy said to me can do be anything you want, anything. Even when people that try to hurt you, even if they don't like you, just brush them off, keep on moving. <clears throat> so, thank you. So, one of, um, so in the middle of the conversation, I left Julian for a second because I started imagining somebody chasing him or my older son, and I lost it there for a second. And I could calculate my anger at a 10, and the, my right leg was twitching like I'm running after somebody who's chasing my child. I don't know how many of you have had that image that if somebody bothers your child, yes. And he brought me back, right? So there's a, there's a lesson that we learn about racial socialization. It's not just what parents say to their children, it's also what children say to their parents. 
that, that children socialize parents as well. And so it does beg this question of um, all children's voices are very important in this discussion about racial injustice. Um, and and uh, does it matter from a child's eyes, from a parent's eyes, how we look at this? So this notion around, I'm gonna ask my colleagues and I'm gonna ask Margaret first, when you think about those ominous clouds of inferiority, you've talked about a little, what do we say to, young, to parents or to children about, uh, about, about racial injustice and, 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 and education? I think, um, as alluded to in Walter's talk, you handle this one way when developmentally children are young, because ideally you want to, in um, just um, in 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 totally in uh, uh, just uh, surround them um, with, if you will, all kinds of messages about who they are, that what their blackness represents in a very positive way, because in the first ten years of life or so, children are sponges, are taking it all in. And that's, let me simply say that by, by, by also undergirding the fact that one of the things that annoys me most as a developmental psychologist, and it may well be because when I started my own PhD at the University of Chicago in the same department that I chair, Comparative Human Development, I began my program with a four-month-old and an 18-month-old. And I knew that my little two little black girls were the most beautiful children, the smartest children, the most talented children in the whole world. Mm -hmm. And our whole, our whole home was organized to communicate that. But what I realized when I began, so I knew what I was doing at home to sort of surround them with all those messages, including my own interpretation of the world, that black meant good, not bad, okay, which the environment communicates if you don't serve as a wedge. But I also understood in terms of the role of teachers in all this, that every textbook that we were reading, when I was interested in knowing something on what does this study say, or this theme say about children of color, anything about black children or minority children was organized C deviance, or C problems, or C pathology. And this is the context of teaching, uh, this is the context of learning that teachers use in educating and supporting other people's children. So from the very beginning, I knew that the context must be responsive to acknowledging the humanity of all children. And this works in a couple of ways. Let me say a couple more things here, Howard is that on the one hand, for African-American children, Hispanic children, Native American children, anyone who is othered, the context has to communicate the value of their humanity and, in fact, see them as human beings. As I understood it from very early on, the problem in terms of training such that individuals don't, are not experienced as support is that they don't view other people's children as human. That is very cold and is very harsh, but it's also very real. Mm -hmm. And so if we don't structure the environment in terms of feedback and knowledge that recognizes our children's humanity, then they're going to pick up in those first, I would say especially, first six, seven years of life, those same messages. But what's really important about the early work by Kenneth and Mamie Clark is that because the environment communicates that everything dark is negative and everything light is positive, because of children's human development, how they think, when children those first seven years of life or so, they don't internalize those negative messages to the self initially. When you ask the question, well, you know, this brown dog, is he negative or positive? Or this brown girl, is she, uh, you know, smart or dumb? They're answering it as a function of the environment, okay? But they don't internalize it in terms of what it means for the self. That happens later. That happens by seven, six, seven, eight, when they're no longer e cognitively egocentric. What I mentioned before, this is really important because a normal way of developing protects young children from these internalized beliefs about the self, given what they're learning. But all that changes in those next few years because they're no longer protected by egocentrism. That's really important because in terms of gap findings that feed into implicit bias, 
it's really important because when children competitively in schools are being confront confronted with tasks, learning, literacy skills, uh, writing, etc., some children around over here have what I call a consonant environment. The messages about who they are are positive, right? And they're members of that group. And that ends up functioning as a, almost as a privilege. On the other hand, kids who are, who've been othered and the messages are negative, they're having to learn the very same skills in school, but they're also dealing with heart aches. Heart aches. It's like for some of you in here this morning, if you have not had your, you know, your coffee, you may be nodding a little bit, okay? You're having a little problem because you need your caffeine. Well, what children need as well is a sense of consonance that I'm picking up messages, I'm wonderful, and I am learning things at the same time because you can, because there's consistency. But what happens with kids of color is that there's dissonance. They're picking up negative messages that they're trying to figure out, well, does this really include me? And they're not getting all the, all the insights that teaching is supposed to provide. Are you following me? So of course you're gonna have gap findings because the agendas are different. One's dealing with heart and head, and one only has to deal with the head because the heart's consistent with the messages that they're getting. Are you following me? Yes. Well, by the, by the time they hit middle childhood and adolescence, they appropriately push back. Adolescents push back and they tell us what they observe, they tell us their truth, and then we send them off to navigate and make sense of police be policing behavior or racist teacher behavior all by themselves without these cultural literacy messages and socialization experiences that Howard is talking about. So we all have a job because we represent the context for other children's learnings about the self and group membership. And if those, if those messages collide, it's like you know, uh, not having your, um, your allergies diagnosed. You know, you need your antihistamine. So cultural socialization for me is like having your, your, anti, uh, your antihistamines in terms of how they deal with your um, allergies in your knapsack, in your backpack. Mm -hmm. It's like having your gel, your, mo your, ca your caffeine always available to you. So when you're starting to nod a little bit, you pull that bad boy out and you use it to perk yourself up. That's how cultural socialization works. Mm -hmm. And it should be a seamless process because then you can use your head and your heart is in good shape. Mm -hmm. But if your heart is not in good shape, then we have a problem, which reminds me again to remind you that we're talking about humanity in the lives of kids of color who were growing up in systems where teachers are being taught not about these children's humanity, but about their difference, about their being less than, about their being psychopathological and have basically been a part of a group that historically has been basically characterized in that way, although it's never officially said, it's always inferred, mm -hmm. which means that it makes it very difficult for kids to garner the support if it's not already there through cultural socialization to push back. And when mm -hmm. they push back by the time they're in, they're in adolescence, then we are afraid. So parental monitoring for me in terms of providing cultural socialization, my work su suggests that it makes a difference. It means then that when the kids are navigating space like Julian and something happens, they know what to do. They literally, in essence, imagine your parents on their shoulders telling them what to do, how to do it, and why. So there is a seamlessness in terms of learning and their development. So the point I want to make is that we, in terms of schooling, we can't isolate children's intellectual and cognitive functioning from their hearts. Yeah. There's affective development in terms of yeah. their hearts but there's also the intellectual, and especially during adolescence, then you've got these huge biological changes that kids don't understand themselves. So think about it. We don't talk about their sexuality. We don't talk about the heinousness of the context. 
and we don't talk about the need for cultural socialization, and we leave these youngsters to figure it out on their own, and then we send them out to function like canaries in the mine, called yeah. the, America, the USA. Yes, thank you. And so it's no wonder we get these gap findings, and therefore I'm asking you today to be a part of an authentic solution, which is to address these issues frontally with kids because we are still the adults and their children or even taller children as adolescents and it's our job to serve as a positive and um, I would say proactive context for their development uh, and learning 24 seven. Thank you, Martin. Um, we are effectively out of time and thank you both for being here. I will end with this notion, the lion story will never be known as long as the hunter is the one to tell it. That's right. Tell your story. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Margaret. Thank you, Walter. <laughs>